everybody. Mike Verkest back with you along with my good friends, Dr. Ratu Sani, Dr. Jeff Jarvis, and a special guest, Dr. Hayden Smith. Boys, 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 what's up? How you doing? It's so good. Like, for a lot of reasons, I'm doing good. First reason. Yeah, so hold on a sec. First reason Uh, I'm doing good is because as hellish as this year has been with COVID, my Oregon Ducks have been blessed with an opportunity to play in the Pac-12 championship because apparently the entire University of Washington football team had to back out because they're COVID positive. So, not the way you want to do it, but, you know, I'll take it. You're you're all in on the a win's a win category, no matter how it came. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. I think it's. I think if the Ducks win the championship, then the Beavs will have beaten the Pac-12 champions this year. Oh man, why you got to be dirty like that? (laughs) It's not so good. Well, I got to. I mean, the Beavs actually have a better record than Michigan does this year. Uh, are actually the same record. So it's really terrible. I, it's it's awful. It's awful. Um, do we? <laughs> did you want to intro like have more formalized introductions? No, I figured that? we'd get to it. That's okay. fine. I mean, I'm already watching the chat on Facebook. Da- Jarvis has already gotten comments on the Grinch. And- have I really? See, yeah, this is the problem. I'm trying to. Uh, I'm jacking around trying to get my comments up so I can read them here. Ah, Bryce. Yes. Hey, Bryce. So funny. What's the, what's the, what's the, what's his little buddy's name? The little dog. I don't remember. Dog. The Grinch's Grinch dog. 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 I don't know. He's got a name. No, I don't think so. Yes, he does. Dr. Smith. What's, what's the Grinch's dog's name? Come on. Oh, you're muted, buddy. <laughs> there we go. I don't know. Oh, I was going to say, we, you're the one with the young kids. All of our kids are older now. So we, we even watched it last night, and I don't even know. <laughs> oh, it's Max. Max, that's right. Max, there you go. Mike Croak, he said. Thank you, Brittany. Brittany. Oh, man, did we get beat up, too? Yeah. We're talking about this, and it just blew up. Everybody's screaming Max at us. Everybody yeah. Knew. Well, hey, listen. I wanted to yes. welcome everybody to a special edition of the Second Shift Podcast. We're partnering up with our old buddy, Dr. Jeff Jarvis from Texas. That's a desert, desert delegated yeah, practice. Right. State. Um, I just wanted to get that out there, but we want, to talk about, we, we want to talk about mRNA vaccines and we had to bring in a specialist, right? And in listening to uh, Dr. Smith's story a little bit before we came on the air, um, he has and had, I should say, a lot of the same questions you might have yeah. watching. So what did he do? He went out and found the answers. And so we're super excited to welcome Dr. Hayden Smith to the show. How are you doing tonight? Great. Pleasure to be here. You know, I'm excited to uh, talk about a lot of things that uh, I've been studying and, and learning about and uh, getting answers to. That's so great. We're, we, we couldn't be more happy to have you. And we also realized that there may be, you know, due to the topic, uh, we might have people that have never really, they maybe, you know, there was this thing was shared so many times, like, a hundred times or something like that. So what we thought we'd do is just go around real quick and we'll introduce ourselves. That way everyone can kind of know. I mean, I don't matter one bit, but I'll start and then we'll go to Dr. Sonny. But my name is Mike Verkest and I'm an educator here at Flight Bridget. I also host the Second Shift podcast as well as the Lighthouse, uh, EMS Lighthouse Project podcast. One of these days I'll get the title right. Dr. Jarvis, stop. I know you're judging me secretly. And I'm also a fire-based EMS trainer. There's nothing secret about it, Mike. Oh, shut up. Um, but uh, I'm just outside of uh, Portland, Oregon. So, Dr. Sani, how about you? Yeah, thanks, Mike. So, I am Ratu Sani, and I am an EMS physician uh, and an emergency physician. I'm EMS medical director in two counties, suburban counties, right outside of Portland, Clackamas County, and um, what's the other county? Oh, yeah, Washington County. Washington County. <laughs> oh, um, and I am the associate medical director for flight bridge ed uh, of the head of the podcast the division apparently and it is a big division and it's a big division i think the and we've just expanded even Getting bigger oh yeah standard of care podcast by the way don't let don't let me forget talk about that at some point uh, we again. won't they're here so they'll they'll remind you oh i know <laughs> nick sam help a brother out 
Anyway. So yeah, that's cool. me. And, and, uh, you know, like all things EMS and I am Mike's medical director, but I yeah. wasn't your medical director when we started this. I know. On this show. It's crazy. Now yeah. he is. It's, it gets weird sometimes, doesn't it? Just it does. Like, when you, Yeah. I can't believe anyway. it. Yeah. Anyway, Dr. Yeah. Jarvis, off to you. Good. My good sir. Well, howdy, y'all. So R- Ratu should not sell himself short. He is also the past president of the National Association of EMS Physicians. That's right. That is, And he is still the head of the advocacy committee for NEMSP um, and is doing great work for our profession and our association. Thank you. That's very nice. That is the That's the only kissing up you're going to get today. That's the nicest you've ever been to me, actually. I know. Well, you're the one who brought it on yourself. <laughs> So uh, I'm Jeff Jarvis. I'm also an EMS and emergency physician. I'm from Texas. I'm just outside of Austin. I'm the medical director for Williamson County EMS and Marble Falls area EMS. Uh, We're suburban Austin. And I'm the co-host of the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast. And uh, Mikey, you are, you most definitely matter. You are the glue that holds us together, and you're also the buffer that keeps me and Ratu from running into each other like matter and antimatter. So you <laughs> absolutely funny. matter, my friend. It's so funny. I just, I just love it. It's so good. It's so good. I, I, I'm, I'm blessed to get to work with both of you. So I appreciate it, Dr. Hayden Smith. Tell us a little yeah. bit about yourself and what's going on with you. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I feel like a, a minnow amongst a big fish here, but. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm a resident here at the Providence Portland Medical Center um, and kind of uh, internal medicine resident. And so we, we kind of do a lot of different things. I'm currently working in the ICU on nights. So, you know, after this, I go right into work. Oh, um, and uh, and uh, so, you know, doing a lot with that and really getting affected by a lot of this uh, COVID stuff. Um, and so I've p- taken a particular interest into doing research on this. Um, you know, I have a lot of research background. I am um, trained as a, a bioinformaticist, uh, also do molecular biology. Um, I have a, have a couple of re- have a review, review article, a couple of pa- papers on, uh, on carbapenemase producing uh, enterobacter. Um, so that's kind of where my wheelhouse is. Um, but um, So what you're saying is you're a fellow nerd. Yes, I'm definitely a fellow nerd. I have I definitely enjoy doing these like uh, deep dives into different topics, um, <laughs> establishing what it means to be an expert in something, and really learning a lot about a particular topic. Love well, it. I'm, I I was just going to say we appreciate you jumping on with us, uh, with the rest of the nerds out there, and uh, we're excited. And one of the things that you know we wanted to do for this particular live episode. I know there's, there's a ton of interest. Um, do me a favor. If you guys could just share this broadcast right now, we want as many people to be able to hear this as possible. And, and, and this has nothing to do with, Oh, we want views or likes or anything like that. This is our plan today. And for this whole thing, since we've been sort of throwing this uh, episode together is we want to help put people a little bit at ease. We understand that people have got questions. We understand that people have got concerns and those are absolutely valid. Whatever questions, unless you think it's contains five G's in a chip, right? If you're one of those people, this, ain't, this I don't even want to talk to you. I got, I got news for you people. If I could get the five G I just paid a thousand dollars for, for free, I would have done that a long time ago. Yeah. yeah I mean, but- I'll give it to you. I, yeah. We've had some requests to know what we're drinking, by the way. Oh, so, well, so just to, to before we hit on that, Mikey is talking about the reason we want so, so many people to know about this. Ultimately, we think getting this virus is actually in the best interest of our country. Getting the vaccine. Vaccine. Getting the vaccine. So sorry. <laughs> we're doing a great before. job of getting the virus all on our own. So uh, really, we have plans for when this pandemic is over. We're going to do a Flight Bridge Ed Kentucky whiskey tour, and the damn virus is standing between us and our whiskey tour. So yeah. get the vaccine so we can go do our whiskey tour. Yeah, no kidding. Amen to that. <laughs> Chimney Christmas. But anyway, we know people have got questions. They've got concerns. What we're hoping to do tonight is with, um, uh, you know, Dr. Smith's uh, expertise, his knowledge, his passion for the science part of this, learning about what does an MRA vaccine do? What does it all mean? 
How does it affect you? Um, that's what we want to kind of learn tonight because it's important for us. I'll, I'll tell you that that we did an informal just sort of email poll at my agency. And I would say one thing I was surprised about is that there were as many, I'm not sure yet, answers to will I take the vaccine as there was to no. And so that means, at least to me, the way I interpret that is that there's just a lot of questions about this vaccine. And I think if we do anything tonight, uh, and this is just me and, and all the three physicians, please chime in. But I really want to hope that we can answer some of those questions, relieve some of those fears, at least if we can't relieve some of those fears or anxieties that you have about it, at least you will know that you have a, an unbiased source of information. We want to give you just the facts about what is an mRNA virus or some vaccine. Thanks, Jarvis. Um, and, um, and really just, <laughs> just get as much information out there as we can. So does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Awesome. All so right. Before we get kicked off, I do oh, think yeah. that somebody had a had the whiskey question. They did. This is one thing that we do every single time. If uh, if uh, we're doing an EMS lighthouse or if we're doing a second shift, which is the more you know, Lucy Goosey, <laughs> easy, easy version. I'll start. I had I actually had a Maker's Mark glass, but it had Blanton in it. It's all gone now. I didn't have much left. Ritu, what about you? So I am having a, a drink. I'm sure somebody had invented this before, but we invented it at home. It is bourbon. This is a Woodford Reserve, along with some Luxardo um, liqueur. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then some orange bitters. We can, um, but we kind of put this together at home. At, at sort of parts of a Manhattan, if you will. We we do we did name the drink after my wife, so I am having a Janet. Hey, nice. That's pretty good. I can't wait to come over and have one of those. Get your friggin' vaccine. All right, Dr. Jarvis, what do you got? We know Dr. Sm Hayden, he's got to work, so he's not drinking anything. Oh, no. That's yeah. so sad. I, well, I, I got a cock and bowl, so ginger beer is oh. my drink of choice. Hey, right ginger now. bowl? Ginger mm -hmm. beer? That's good. I'm sorry, it's called a what? Cock and bowl. Oh, my God. That is what he said. Yeah. That's <laughs> great. That's so, so funny. He's perfect for us. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh. He's a nerd. He drinks cool shit. And he, yeah. No, you blend, my friend. Not as cool as uh, Andy Seth, apparently, drinking a Weller 12-year. Oh. Lake I like that. No, well, I got uh, so, going on. Yeah, I was having a Makers earlier. I've been playing with keeping it in the freezer. Um, it's kind of cool. Bumps up the viscosity quite a bit. Uh, but it changes the taste, so I'm not sure I'm a fan. So I switched to my room temperature basil Hayden. Okay, there ain't nothing wrong with that. All right, let's jump into this. Uh, so, Dr. Smith, I would love for you to go ahead and share your screen, and then I'm going to do some manipulation of our screen so I can get us all sort of in here at the same time. Yeah. And uh, I, will get us, I will get us moving here. So I'm going to do this. So what, are, well, you can go ahead and share whenever you're ready. Yeah, one sec. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Like I said, we're pretty loosey goosey here. Sure. So you know, just kind of give people context where this sure, thing. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I was so I was you know reading about all of this stuff late last month or middle of November, I guess. And you know, I was just kind of concerned with everything that was going on. You know, there was things were moving really, really fast with this vaccine. And then I heard word that it was an mRNA vaccine, which is something that I was not familiar with. Uh, and so I was, you know, really worried about what that actually meant. And on further investigation, you know, there's never been an mRNA vaccine given FDA approval and given to the general public. So it's, you know, this is something that's brand new to the medical community. And just a ton of red flags kind of came up. I remember... I was talking with one of my colleagues, Dr. Amy Deckett. She's an amazing ID physician here. And she didn't have any answers for me. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, I need to learn about this. I need to figure out what's going on. I need to come up with the answers myself. So I, you know, I feel like I'm very similar to a lot of the viewers that view this podcast and that, you know, I'm not like this big ex, this, you know, have big titles and, and, you know, leaders of things, but I am someone that, you know, can really get in and get into the weeds of stuff and, and learn and, and gather information and answer those questions. Um, and so in that sense, you know, I feel like I've 
been able to go through kind of a, an educational journey, if you will, to understand you know, what is an mRNA vaccine and really ultimately is this something that's safe that I can put in my body? You know, I'm, I want to make sure I understand stuff. Um, so this is kind of a presentation I made in, in that light just to kind of help me um, figure everything out um, yeah. and then uh, also to, um, you know, give education to other people because, you know, it's important to me to, to share what I know with others. And so this is something I came up with. Um, and, you know, the, the main, main thing about it that's really unique about this mRNA vaccine is I'm really getting all my information on it, initially at least, from news media. You know, and I got a question about, you know, is the, what news media outlet or what outlet do you use to get information? And in my yeah. response, none of them. You know, I, I don't really trust anything that anyone says um, at face value. You know, I think that it's important to see what different companies say, what the administration says. Um, but there's also, you know, a desire to understand um, for myself. And Dr. Anthony Fauci is an amazing ID physician, and he, but he said this, and it kind of uh, didn't hit me cr well. You know, he said, it seems extraordinary that people don't want to rush to get the vaccine as opposed to being skeptical about it. When you see something that you have as an em enormously effective tool and people don't want to use it, it's quite frustrating. And, um, you know, I, I see what he's saying there. You know, the, the vaccine seems to be effective, and we want everyone to get it. But at the same time, this is an mRNA vaccine. There's a lot of red flags that I didn't know and I wanted to get the answers to before I, it was something that I could, um, I could agree with. Um, and so um, I wanted to do the, the research myself. And ultimately, as a clinician, my goal is to do no harm. You know, I made the, that oath to follow through with that. And so I want to make sure that I'm, I'm prepared to answer any questions that come my way. So in order to start this journey, and this is kind of the whole point of the one of the main things of the podcast and something that I want to, where I started was, okay, what's the basics of vaccines and immunity? Um, you know, I'm not a complete genius, and so I didn't have this all memorized. <laughs> you didn't? Oh, well, no. a complete genius. Yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't fit in with us. <laughs> there, so, so I had to relearn a lot of this stuff, too. Um, so it really kind of immunity breaks into two different sections. You have what's called hemorrhal immunity um, and what's called cellular immunity. And really the main thing I want you to understand uh, is that with hemorrhal immunity, you get antibodies. And with cellular immunity, you get a cell that's called a cytotoxic T lymphocyte. So Hemorrhal immunity is pretty easy to think about. You know, you have some sort of um, protein, antigen, something in your body that then reacts with your immune system and you get the antibodies to that particular protein. Whereas, but cellular immunity is a little different. Uh, that one is an immune response to get intracellular pathogens um, like viruses. And so when you have an immune response to a virus, it's typically the cellular immune response. Mm. And I'll go into a little bit more detail later about how that happens. Um, but, you know, I just kind of want to pause here and see if, you know, if you have any questions about this. So, so Hayden, one of the challenges with like the vaccine and with a lot of stuff that we we're seeing is that when we try to measure immunity, we're measuring just antibodies, right? Yeah. People are doing mm -hmm. antibody testing, but we don't really have a good way to measure the cellular response. Because yeah. um, that's a lot of people are like, well, the antibodies may be gone in six months or nine months. But then I've seen a lot of other arguments that, but the T cell response is really where it's at for this. Mm -hmm. And that, that may be persistent even lifetime. Yeah. So that's a really good point. So with and that's one of the key differences between the different vaccines that you get. You know, a lot of vaccines, uh, especially the ones uh, for bacteria, so these are common vaccines. And these are the ones for bacteria. And a lot of times these require boosters because 
your Hemoral oh. immune response doesn't have a complete immune response. You can sometimes lose memory uh, with it. Whereas with the cellular immune response, that's actually a full, robust immune response, and it creates both antibodies and cytotoxic T cells. So, you know, the holy grail of vaccine development is a cellular immune response. But a lot of the vaccines that we, we use are these what are called subunit vaccines, that create a, uh, a humoral immune response. And you also notice with these, it's a lot of bacteria vaccines. And if you think about the way bacteria work, we know that there's a big difference between bacteria and viruses. Bacteria are primarily you know, extracellular, outside of the cell pathogen, whereas viruses require to be inside of a cell to replicate. And so a lot of the, the subunit vaccines are um, targeting this humoral immune response, whereas our live attenuated vaccines are only for viruses. And, you know, you'll notice with these ones, excuse me, these ones uh, are your, you know, once in your lifetime, you get the MMR vaccine, you get smallpox once, chickenpox once, and you have the immunity there. So comparing the two, this is kind of a graph to show a, a comparison between them. Subunit vaccines are great because they're easy to, the easier to develop and they're um, a little bit safer in that there's no risk of uh, reactivation of the live attenuated virus. Um, but that's kind of a comparison between the two. Um, so with COVID, you know, things that are most important to me is it needs to be safe, number one. Number two, it needs to be quick to develop. To, be, to develop, and number three, it needs to obviously target the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So yeah, any question? I guess you know what is what are the comments saying? What questions do people have about that? Uh, we've got a, we've got a couple. Um, I I don't know if the, the that they're pertinent to the discussion just yet. Sure. They're definitely so so. Some people are asking like, how long do you think an mRNA vaccine would last? Would you need a booster for that? And I think yeah. we've seen some of that as most of these are a two phase sort of, um, you know, vaccination, right? So you need one, and then depending on which version you get, you need one twenty one days or twenty eight days later, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that kind of, you know, is a great segue into this next question that I had. So once I kind of established that baseline, okay, what is an immune response, right? I wanted to see, okay, how does an mRNA vaccine fit into this whole picture? So um, there's been a, quite a bit of research on mRNA vaccines. Um, and it, the, the research actually goes back... Um, you know, decades. So this is this, this concept has been around for a while, uh, and there's been a, an mRNA vaccine of of uh, different types. I believe the first trial was in 2012, mm. um, and that was pioneered by a lot of this research in mRNA vaccines has been pioneered by Moderna. So that's the vaccine company that is in the news. Uh, but their their roots hail back pretty far um, as far as this technology goes. And so there, a lot of the information I get on this science really comes from research that they did. Um, so this is a really awesome picture that I think does a really good job at explaining how mRNA vaccines work. Um, and uh, I'll kind of step through it with everyone. And it's really kind of why I wanted to share these slides. Absolutely. Uh, is because this really steps us through step by step how to get an mRNA vaccine, how an mRNA vaccine works. So if we look at step one, we have um, a DNA or, or mRNA template. And this mRNA gets packaged up. Um, and we'll, we can talk about that in a little bit because there's yeah. a lot of questions about that whole process. Yeah, for sure. Right. Yeah, so, so um, Hayden, could you talk? So it's possible that. Some folks have forgotten what they remember from uh, biology. What's the difference between DNA, RNA? Yeah, great. Um, so DNA is kind of the, the template molecule that has all the genetic information in it. And RNA is kind of a temporary molecule that the body uses in order to focus um, development of proteins. So your body takes a DNA template that's in all of our cells and produces mRNA based upon what its needs are. And so this process, it 
gets hijacked by vac uh, by viruses very commonly, where it packages away um, R DNA or RNA molecules inside of its little capsules, and get and then what it, the virus does is it gets that um, that genetic information into a cell, uh, and the cell then produces the virus proteins with that information. And so the mRNA vaccines kind of take a pretty similar approach to what biology has already done with, or what nature has already done with viruses. And that it, what the vaccine does is it takes an mRNA strand of a particular protein. In the case of uh, the COVID vaccine, it's the SARS-CoV-2 um, spike protein. protein yeah. That's what the mRNA codes for. And that makes its way into a cell via what's called an endosome. And this endosome, because it's looking at, you know, DNA or RNA, it releases it into the, the, the cytoplasm or the, basically the inside of the cell. That triggers a response in the cell to then create the antigen. Um, so the, the endosome, so the mRNA uh, is translated into protein via the ribosome. Right. Just like any other mRNA would in the body. You know, your body does this, you know, all day, creating mRNA, making antigens, or sorry, making proteins with ribosomes. Yeah. So then, oh, go ahead. I was just say, so, uh, you know, when I was first learned about this stuff, it was like, you know, ribosomes are the protein factory. Mm -hmm. This is um, right after we first learned this in the 50s. That's right. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if you were going to get to this part, Hayden, or not, but one of the questions that I've heard multiple times now is um, I've heard that this rewrites your DNA. Mm. And, and so I think it's important to point out that the, the mRNA, the messenger RNA, never gets into the nucleus, which is where your DNA resides. That's correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, Ratu, let me ask you this. Is the other, I think one big worry we have when people hear that we're messing with genes is that we will pat, we'll make some change and we will, you know, a, a Franken gene yeah. and we'll pass this down to our kids. The key thing here is, is not only are we not mucking with DNA, we're not mucking with the germ cell line. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're exactly. not going to pass this on to your kids, so don't worry about that. Nope. No, and you don't pass chicken pox on to your kids either, right? Mm -hmm. Think about well, that. That's well, not, this, not this way, way anyway. It integrates itself. <laughs> right. But, but that virus integrates itself into your DNA, and you don't pass that on. So, so it, you're absolutely right, Jeff, in that it has to be specific to the germ cell line. Right. But this doesn't even get into your nucleus. It's just sort of hijacking the ribosome in the, in the, in the cytoplasm or the kind of the work area of the cell. Yeah. And that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the vaccine only targets the ribosome uh, and then any immune cells after, after that. And so, you know, it's pretty safe uh, at that end, you know, once this, the mRNA gets inside of your cell, it's a very straightforward response. You know, your body knows what to do with this um, and it, it makes, the, the proteins, the spike protein in this case. Um, so Hayden, let me ask you this from a, I, I obviously went to Texas A&M. I'm an Aggie. I like to make things simple because otherwise I can't understand them. Yeah. Um, if you can put a bunch of pictures of tractors and corn stalks, that would be great. If you can somehow integrate that, that would help. Dr. Okay. Jerry. Somebody here is going to ask for pictures of sheep. I know what you're doing. I know where you're going with that. <laughs> Um, are we essentially talking about here a like a biologic version of a 3D printer to print out spike protein? Um, you could think of it like that. I mean, yeah, I mean, you're, you can. That would be a stupid way of thinking about it, but you could. You're, 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 <laughs> you're, giving, you're giving the cells the information they need to print out the protein. So, yeah, that's that's essentially what's going on here. Perfect. And so once once you have that protein in, in your cells, the uh, 
the body then, or the cell recognizes that as foreign, degrades it immediately. And so that, that's one thing that was you know, reassuring to me is the, these proteins that we're making inside of, the, inside of our cells, uh, they are uh, degraded immediately. It's not like this stuff floats around inside your cells like a virus does. It, it, go, it gets printed and then degraded immediately with the proteasome. And so then after it gets degraded, that's when you get the immune response. Uh, that's when the, the, um, the protein bits find their way on, onto different receptors, which then initiate the immune response. And in this case, it activates the cellular immune response. So you get both antibodies and cytotoxic T cells uh, to manage any future COVID infections when you have a, with these mRNA vaccines. And so that's kind of the beauty of it is, um, it does, it is able to, you're able to make the protein yourself and then activate the immune response as you would in a normal infection. And that's kind of the, the real takeaway that I got from the, um, from my research on this aspect of the vaccine is the whole science behind mRNA vaccines is to actually closer mimic what happens when you get a virus when you get an infection uh, than previous viral um, vaccines um, you know you have the the uh, live attenuated vaccines kind of get to this but it's not quite as clean as it is when you get the mRNA vi vaccines it's it's really very cool it is it's really cool it's pretty amazing. What happens to the mRNA, um, Hayden? Yeah, so good question. So that gets degraded. So, you know, like I said, the mRNA is just a, a template. It's a, it's a temporary molecule. So similar to how quickly the foreign uh, spike proteins get degraded, the foreign mRNA gets degraded pretty quickly too. So the, the actual vaccine parts are not in your body all that long, but you get a really prolonged immune response to it as a result of that. So, and, and I might be jumping ahead a little bit, but yeah. there's been some question and, and you may or may not have, or anyone maybe watching or even Dr. Sonny or Dr. Jarvis, but so these vaccines may provide immunity, but do we know if they provide um, an ability for you to not shed the virus. So, so let's say you're immune, right? But you end up contracting. Would, would this, would this, would these vaccines be able to prevent you from spreading that same disease to somebody else that's maybe unvaccinated? Yeah. So you're talking about asymptomatic spread, right? For, and uh, somebody that's been vaccinated. Yeah. Right? So that's a really good question. Um, and we have to look to the different clinical trials uh, and, to understand the answer to that question. Um, and no clinical trials are actually more robust than the COVID ones, but there have been many clinical trials on this, on these mRNA vaccines. Yeah. As far as asymptomatic viral shedding or um, preventing minor disease, it's hard to say. Right. Um, the COVID vaccine, the ones by Moderna and Pfizer, they only looked at symptomatic COVID yeah. um, infections yeah so they didn't they didn't screen everyone to see if there was asymptomatic or minor you know you know you know like a attenuated immune response to a a covid back to a covid virus sure um so so hard to say yeah okay fair enough <laughs> I, and, and i think i think um yeah, that's one of the take-home points you know people want to be able to get the shot and take off their masks forever and I don't think that's yeah. possible. The other thing that's interesting is, you know, the AstraZeneca, um, and I haven't read their paper yet. I've just looked at some other stuff, but their paper's out also. And I think we're going to talk a little bit about the Pfizer paper um, in a little bit. But um, one of the things about the AstraZeneca paper is that I believe they did actually do um, testing of the of people uh, who, even if they were asymptomatic and, mm -hmm. uh, and as a result, you know, they're reporting that that, vi that vaccine is only 70% effective 
but it's an apples to oranges comparison. In the Pfizer side, you you were positive if you got symptoms and then they tested you and you had coronavirus. And AstraZeneca, if you ever tested positive for it, then they counted you as positive. And some of those people, I believe, were asymptomatic. And, mm -hmm. and so it may be that at the end of the day that the AstraZeneca is not and the and the Pfizer and the Moderna ones are actually closer in effectiveness than 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 is initially reported. Yeah, I think that's I think that's absolutely true. You know, the AstraZeneca vaccine is. I'm, it's interesting that you bring that up. So the AstraZeneca vac vaccine is also a brand new vaccine, and I don't think that's really been discussed in the media either. So AstraZeneca is very similar to these mRNA vaccines, except for they use. Um, they use DNA instead of mRNA. And so they are also considered a part of this new class of vaccines called genetic vaccines. Also um, not in the germline, by the way. What's that? I said also not in the germline. No. No Franken babies here. Don't don't no worry about that. Exactly. I think that scares people in itself when you say something is genetic based. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and what that is referencing is the molecule that's being used to transfer the information. And so, you know, um, yeah, so genetic is just kind of a big broad term we use to reference nucleic acids. So I prefer call, I prefer referring to them as nucleic acid vaccines. Um, but unfortunately that's not the name that's been given to them. Right. But yeah. they're, they're really nucleic acid vaccines, which is just to name the fact that it's, DNA or RNA that's being uh, given to the cells. So, so you mentioned a little bit earlier, maybe it was before we came on, but we did talk a little bit about the science of mRNA, right? Like, oh my gosh, is it this, this new thing? Is this vaccine this whole, whole new thing? But it's really interesting science, right? And I know that was one piece that, that you know, all three physicians that are on here were talking about is it's, it's not – the most outlandish thing in the world. It's just sort of a newer thing, right? Could you talk a little bit more about that and, and how, yeah. I mean, and we are, I mean, we discussed like with pictures, the, the pieces that are involved, but um, again, my, my want and need and desire at the end of this broadcast is for people to feel safer. So maybe yeah. talk a little bit about sort of the science part of MRNA and how it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's yeah. super cool. You know, and it's super interesting, and there's a lot of really interesting science out there. But you know, I'm a pragmatist. I'm a pragmatist. You know, I want to know if something actually works, and if it's a if it's safe. You know, you can have the coolest science in the world, but if it doesn't work and it isn't safe, gee, you know, so what? And so a lot of so then after I kind of understood the basics of what was going on with these mRNA vaccines, I understood the science behind them. I kind of changed my focus and wanted to learn, are these vaccines actually safe? You know, just kind of what I know about um, how the body works. Uh, the thought is, you know, pumping a bunch of mRNA into someone that could cause different autoimmune diseases, um, like lupus or something, or you could have um, different reactions. You could have like the thing that Jeff is talking about where, you know, is, does this get into the, the, the DNA? Does this get into your genome? And, and the answer to a lot of those questions is no, it doesn't. Um, the, the first step that I took is I looked at some really old clinical trials of these mRNA vaccines to see if there's any ground for what I was concerned about. And the first trials of mRNA vaccines did what I presumed they would do, and that was to just inject a bunch of mRNA a free mRNA into the body in a vaccine and see if that caused an immune response. And if the trials did not go that well, they didn't really have any um, conversion of the, a zero conversion or creating antibodies to the uh, vaccine. So it didn't work. And then it didn't really, in it, there were a lot of side effects, no serious side effects. So nothing you know, on the scale of like, inducing an autoimmune condition or causing um, changes to a patient's DNA. So that, that didn't happen. But there were a lot of like, you know, um, weird reactions. A lot of people got super febrile. 
Uh, there's a case of like Bell's palsy. And these are all in um, like phase one clinical trials where only one person had seroconversion and like everyone had side effects. So it clearly didn't work. Um, but what the researchers did is they took this idea and they figured out how to make it work really well. Um, so they then introduced a concept, what's called a my cell. Um, it was a new term to me. Uh, and what that is, is it's basically they wrapped the um, mRNA in kind of like a package to hide it from the body until it gets inside of the cell, just like right. the virus does. And so they wrapped it in this micelle. It's basically made up of carbohydrates and fats. Yeah. Um, and so they wrapped it in this package and then injected that um, in the next vaccine um, a couple of years later. It took them a while to really narrow it down. And they saw complete, you know, they saw, you know, drastically reduced side effects after they did that. And mm. they saw you know, almost, they saw near perfect seroconversion, um, like we're seeing in these COVID vaccines after they wrapped it. And the really interesting thing about this package is that they can now target different cell lines with the different um, way they make the package. Hmm. So, you know, there was one really interesting study I saw where they were able to target thyroid cells. You know, they, the whole study was really to just see if they wow. can target a cell line. And they got something like, oh, I don't want to quote numbers, but it was, you know, a significant number around 70% range of the, DN, the, the nucleic acid information, the mRNA into the thyroid with, you know, they kind of tracked it with different radio labels or um, sure. stuff. And so, you know, not only was the vaccine able to, um, cause the expected response, but now they're able to target specific cell lines to get the mRNA into the cells they wanted to get it to get it into. And so, you know, that is something that was really reassuring to me that this is something that they have really studied and perfected. Not, I guess, I can't say perfected. Nothing's perfect, but they've really developed the the package that the mRNA comes in. So that becomes a really viable um, treatment option. And I think that's, I think a lot of people, that's the other question is, what is this package? What is this? And, and in this case, I think it's primarily lipids that the mm -hmm. mRNA in, in, and at least the Pfizer paper. And I did, I haven't read Moderna hasn't put out their, Not yet. their phase three paper like Pfizer has. Um, but um, yeah, what what is this lipid package, and is there something to be concerned about here? Yeah, so the lipid packages, um, where I would imagine a lot of the vaccines are going to differ, um, and so you know that is something that you know these are also um, so a lot of the information I'm getting now is kind of from their websites. Which, so you have to take it with a grain of salt, you know, on specifics on what their packaging is. The, the science is well established as far as the science of my cells and they, they work and a lot of people use them. Um, but the actual, what are they made of? The actual little parts in there to target different cell lines and stuff, you know, that, that's not published. They're, that's what they write patents on and stuff. And it's all stuff that, um, I haven't looked into yet. Mm -hmm. I, I say that to mean that um, the the vaccines are different and that's likely how they're different. You know, I get a lot of questions of, well, why can't I just take Moderna and Pfizer? You know, I need to get two. Can I interchange them and stuff like that? And the answer is probably shouldn't because they are different vaccines. They're packaged differently. Yeah. Sure, it's the same mRNA strand in both, but the packaging is different and, and the trials and the, and the research is done um, with the same vaccine. And so you have to take them both at the same time. Yeah. The, the, the super cool to me, I mean, this is fascinating and, and, and from a, obviously from the aspect of the pragmatic aspect is, is it safe? That's really important. Um, in the preliminary, you know, the, the phase three, 
Pfizer trial, which we can talk about in a couple minutes, and we probably should talk about again on other podcasts. Yeah. Maybe uh, even just dedicate an entire podcast to the clinical evidence of it. And what if there was, uh, what if there was a, something about the legal issues of vaccines and mandatory? We can about the legal issue. We could have a separate podcast, like a separate podcast, podcast that just talks about that. So if what you're saying here is we're going through the on it. bridge trifecta. Yeah. Yeah. Hayden's looking at us like we're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> We, okay. In the Flightbridge family, we have more than, as we explained, we have more than one podcast. And push in the family podcast here. Consider the <laughs> section. But what, what is super exciting is, you know, this is not our last pandemic, right? And what is very interesting to me about this, uh, you know, when, when, when coronavirus, when this started, they had the genetic code for this baby in like a month and a half. And it just seems to me that the next time, the next go around, that we that that as soon as they get the genetic code, they can then start working on what is the piece of mRNA that we want to put in some kind of fat package, and like myself, for instance. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, what is the piece of mRNA that we want to put in there? And it, it the the just the the potential is really amazing to me and our ability to react much i mean th to do this in a year is a you know crazy in itself but our ability to react to the next pandemic or next serious infection um is really that's that's just outstanding well it, i'm glad you brought that up Rich, because um that is that kind of leads me on to my next real big question about these mRNA vaccines is why has, why don't we have one before? You know, it seems like, you know, if yeah. China has this technology, why don't they own the, the vaccine market? You know, why don't, why doesn't, why doesn't it, why isn't it everywhere? Yeah. Why is there not an HIV vaccine? Yeah. yeah. Great or, question. Or one for say other coronaviruses, like or say other coronaviruses. cold. Yeah, I you know I that's all that was my next question. I was like, what's holding them up? Like, is there something that I'm missing here? And so, even though conceptually it makes sense, even though the science makes sense, and even though you know they kind of were able to fix a lot of the problems with this vaccine, I still had this question that was like, well, why isn't it everywhere? You know? And so I went in and, and looked a, a harder even on. Um, Moderna and a lot of their work, because like I was saying, they're the, kind of the pioneers of this, and they're they're um, in this realm. They're a huge player, and but they don't produce any vaccines. They don't have any vaccines, and so their first approved pro anything. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and so and and this might need fact check, but I'm fairly certain Pfizer doesn't have a vaccine either. So, um, oh, so I just Pfizer had everything. Yeah, you think, but that I, I'm like barely certain they don't even have a vaccine. I could be completely wrong, so don't take that at face value. But you know, when I looked really briefly, I couldn't find any Pfizer vaccines either. So, you know, I, I then went in and said, okay, so who is Moderna? And then I want to say, who is BioNTech? Because we know Pfizer buddied up with BioNTech. Right. So who are they, right? If Pfizer's putting all their chips in that in that basket, I, I should probably know who they are. And so um, Moderna um, has done a lot of work on the Zika virus. And I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, and like the vast majority of the clinical trials and research they've done use the Zika virus as their vector. And there's a couple of reasons why they haven't been able to create a Zika virus vaccine. One and probably the biggest is that Zika virus um, is a waning epidemic. Mm, sure. Not much of a demand for it and not much funding for it. And so that- Unless um, you happen to be David Person, live in Houston, Texas. Sure. <laughs> So David Pierce is the EMS medical director there in Houston. He's also the public health director. Oh, okay. This is about Zika virus. Gotcha. 
So, so they've been working on this for a while, and it's kind of a, a waning infection it, or an epidemic. It's not. Um, and then the other problem with it is that they found unique to Zika virus is that if you don't get a full immune reaction to Zika virus, um, so like full cellular immunity, antibodies, all that stuff, right. you actually cause a paradoxical worse infection when you get the Zika virus. Hmm. So again, it's all information unique to Zika, not COVID. Uh, <laughs> it's a completely different virus. Yeah. Uh, weird, paradoxical, worse reaction. And so they've been struggling with, you know, making a virus for, a, for an epidemic that's going away um, for reasons not completely understood. Um, they're working with a virus that's very finicky. And then third, and the real kicker is they're making a vaccine that they want to give to pregnant people. So that's like the highest risk group that you can possibly right. get a vaccine for. And so they're really working against themselves um, in making a, a Zika vaccine. Um, they also did some rabies vaccines. They dabbled in an influenza vaccine, um, but nothing really came of those because um, either a vaccine exists or a treatment exists. And so it's hard to, um, take the place of an already established treatment that, you know, is a vaccine that works really well, is yeah. much cheaper than what you're going to be making. And um, so it's like, why? And so they, they, um, they, there's not really been an opportunity to create a new vaccine until now. And so the, so as far as Moderna goes, that's kind of where their research goes and, and, <laughs> you know, even though they don't have a product yet, they are very, they are one kind of the lead leaguers and lead leaders in this field. Um, and they, they've done quite a bit of research in other viruses. So going back to what Dr. Sani was saying, you know, when the next epidemic comes, you can just change the mRNA and boom, you have a new vaccine. And the reality is that new pandemic is COVID-19 for these vaccines. The research has been there. They've been doing clinical trials since, you know, for at least for almost a decade now on mRNA vaccines. They haven't shown there's been no instances of severe, severe uh, adverse reactions. And, you know, far more that, you know, there's a lot of unreported safety, safety data um, in mRNA vaccines that's done on other viruses than just COVID. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, there's right. actually quite a bit of safety data out there on mRNA vaccines. Um, and so that's another reason why I was like, okay, this is a safe vaccine that we can, that we can give. And it has been pretty well, um, pretty well vetted in a lot of other clinical trials. Um, and so that is, you know, another point of that. I was like, okay, another, you know, concern appeased because, there's there's actually quite a bit of data out there. So so there, that that brings us to like there's a lot of lot of great chat going on, you guys, in the comments. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you for sharing the video so people can get information. But I, I think you know a huge concern that people have is that I mean I guess I'll just say it is that we don't know anything about long term effects, right? So I, w there's no way to really answer probably satisfactorily that question that anybody's got about long-term effects, but at the same time, and just for the record, I'll be the first in line just so you know, um, it, it, over. it seems to me that based on what we know about MRNA vaccines, based on what we've seen in the past with other stuff, I guess, I guess you just can't say it, but it seems to me listening to you guys talk about this or specifically Dr. Smith, I guess, is, I mean, it doesn't sound like there should be much of anything as far as long-term effects. Mm -hmm. There shouldn't be. You know, there these other trials that have been done on mRNA vaccines do have long-term follow-up, and right. they haven't seen any significant side effects. And the reality is the vaccine is in your system for such a short period of time. You know, the, the packaged mRNA gets into your body, and the mRNA is produced and destroyed very quickly. I mean, we're talking the order of days 
even hours versus instead of um, weeks or months. So, you know, it's in your, it's in your body for only a brief period of time. Um, and then the, uh, and then the, the proteins that are produced are also in your body for a short period of time. A lot of the stuff that we see, um, and so, so it's, it's not like there's a prolonged side effect profile from this. But, yeah. And I think for me, one of the things that, um, because I had the same question, right? So a typical vaccine, you know, a phase three trial, part of that trial, and the reason why they can't go to full, why they can only go to EUA on this is because they have to follow these folks out for two years. Um, in which we don't- Two months. Yeah. Two months. Uh, so, you know, the, the majority of trials, the major majority of previous vaccine trials like 99.9% .9 of any reactions were in the first six weeks. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're well beyond that with these trials. So that's really a good piece of information. But when I learned that the, exactly what, what, what Dr. Smith is talking about with the Moderna in particular, but with this sort of 10 year history and there being other MRNA smaller trials, but again, showing a pretty vigorous immune response, but no serious adverse events and no long-term serious adverse events. Um, it fit with the theory. You know, it's one thing if the theory says this, but you're, you're always, but, but the practical kind of what you see says something else, but it fit with the theory of the vac the way the vaccine works too. So I, I felt much better knowing that, even though this is the first, this Pfizer BioNTech vaccine is the first mRNA, uh, you know, EUA approval. Um, it's not, not a new concept, and there have been other smaller trials done with it. Yeah, it's not out of left field. Um, and I think I forgot to mention BioNTech as well. I'm glad you brought them back, back up. You know, they are a German company, uh, and they primarily focus on cancer vaccines. So. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear different, um, you know, you see in the news sometimes, oh, they're creating a vaccine for cancer and it gets all this hype and all of it, all this excitement. Well, the reality is the majority of those vaccines are mRNA vaccines. And so the BioNTech um, of the companies that do cancer vaccine research, um, BioNTech is the biggest one um, from what I was able to, to find. Um, and so they... Uh, so that's why Pfizer went to them. So they went. They went to the. So Moderna is the biggest in kind of the infectious disease field as far as mRNA vaccines go. But BioNTech's the biggest in the in the cancer field. And so I just you know, it's as simple as switching the mRNA. They just changed the sequence inside of whatever package they had uh, to be uh, the spike protein, and boom, they had a new vaccine, and were able to get production. And so I get a lot of questions about you know why is why have we been able to develop these vaccines faster than any other vaccine? And the reality does boil down to that one point. You know, we've been working on mRNA vaccines for a, almost a decade now. And all you have to do is change the mRNA inside of that to then go into clinical trial. And so that that's essentially what they did. They, they did, I mean, they did do research on rats and stuff beforehand with the COVID vaccine, but that can all get sped up really, really quickly because you're not reinventing the wheel here. The wheels already existed. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to, you know, put new hubcaps on it. So let me ask you this: the um, there is something characteristic about coronaviruses. Uh, this one in particular, but all coronaviruses have this little spike protein, uh -huh. um, and the spike protein is what allows it to attack cells and have its effect. So. Is there something unique? It seems like if you're going to make an mRNA vaccine, you have to be coding for something specific that allows you to create an immune response. So is there something about the corona vaccine or the coronavirus and its spike proteins that make it more amenable to creating a vaccine? Are there other types of viruses, for example, that may not have something um, as readily identifiable? that may be more challenging to make an mRNA vaccine? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're into a realm of a little more speculation. It's not um, speculation uh, would be my guess. 
Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of evidence that does support the theory that um, these COVID, this COVID virus, um, SARS-CoV-2, is cause a lot, uh, a, a massive immune response when you get it. I mean, that's why we see people coming into the ER and crashing because, you know, SARS-CoV-2 comes in and just is very immunogenic. It causes a very robust immune response. And the key to that is the spike protein that's been well established in previous coronavirus um, epidemics. And it's certainly the case with this one. And then to your second point, are there viruses that don't have that response? And my answer is yes, clearly. You know, you have, we get colds all the time. Those ones don't cause as strong of an immune response. Um, and then, the, you know, back to Zika. You know, that's a virus that does not cause a massive immune response. You know, the whole point with Zika is it's an asymptomatic infection in pregnant people. It causes microcephaly. And so, you know, that, that one doesn't cause this robust immune response. And so it's a lot harder to find that, you know, that protein that you need to code for in order to create uh, the full cellular immune response. All right. So let, me, and, let me ask you a follow-up question. Specifically, yeah. this is a question from Jeff's dad. Yeah. So, um, I was, and the reason I haven't shaved and I look like I just got off a bus is because I've been out here hunting all weekend. Um, and I got back. So I was discussing this with my dad and he said, well, what's going to happen when we put all this money and we distribute this vaccine all over the country and then the virus mutates? Yeah. What are the odds that that will happen? I love that. So, I had an answer, but I, I can't wait to hear yours. What's that? I said, I, I have my answer to it. I may have been right. I may have been wrong. I'm really interested in your ears. Yeah. So um, this kind of touches back to my background in bioinformatics. So I had this question as well. We get, we get this virus. What happens then? And the reality is we've had the um, COVID around for almost a year now. Uh, and so we have a whole year's worth of genetic data to then compare and as we look at the genome as it's mutated over the course of a year. And this can help us answer the question, will we need a new COVID vaccine next year, right? And, I, and that's kind of what it boils down to. How quickly is this mutating? Is this like the flu? Yada, yada, yada. And the, the reality is that the, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine does mutate as with any, any virus, but it mutates at a less frequent rate than a standard virus. So there's, there's frequency rates for genetic data, for genomes, for all microorganisms. And SARS-CoV-2 mutates less frequently. And so um, that puts it on the level of other standard viruses. Um, you know, you have rhinoviruses and, and common cold viruses, and those mutation rates are less. It, it's kind of on the order of that. It's not like the flu where you change the um, the H or the N protein and you have a new flu virus. It's not like that. Hmm. Hey, I just wanted to just interject real quick. I know there's apparently an echo that is coming from somewhere. I have yeah. no idea why that started. I got 50 people texting me. Um, and messaging me on Facebook, so I'm not I'm not sure why it's doing that. So we apologize for that. Um, yeah, I just knocked my volume down. I know Ratu did, uh, Mike did. I'm not sure what's going on. I'll just switch over to headphones and shut the speakers down altogether. I don't I don't know why that's happening all of a sudden, but it's still happening. I can hear it. So I don't know if it's a volume issue or a, a platform issue or what. But I apologize for that, you guys. So I have a just to follow up on that. Here's my my thought process on uh, the mutation. So this particular approach is targeting the spike protein, and the spike protein allows the virus to attach to the ACE uh, receptor, and that's how it gets into the cell. So if the virus in our uh, immune response is aimed at that spike protein, so if all of a sudden the virus mutates and this would have to be a way significant mutation, but now there's no more spike protein. Well, our immune response is targeted to the spike protein and now it's not there. So our immune response doesn't work. Okay. Well, maybe, but the good news is the spike protein is how the virus works. 
Yeah. So the, the main immunogenic protein is the spike protein. So if we're mutating that, uh, in order for the virus to survive, it's going to have to mutate in a way that it can still infect us. Um, and so the general trend in infectious diseases like in all in all microorganisms is actually a trend to being less pathogenic. And right. so you, you have, so that's where we get all of our cold viruses from. A lot of the time they started out as you know, more profound infections, but then they mutate to where they are less, um, less, uh, because of less symptoms. I believe my family's coming back, so maybe you'll get to say that then. Here. <laughs> we can always wish Merry Christmas. They were, they there were, they are. Yeah. This is my oh, look at that. Hey, guys. Hello. Hi. Hi. Welcome to the magic of podcasting and broadcasting. Say hi to the 91 people who are watching us right now. <laughs> hi. Hello. That was cute. So. He likes to pretend to be do uh, play doctor sometimes. Yeah. Hey, nice. what do you know? I do too. Can you so, your Jeff, name? watch your mouth, please. Kieran. Yeah. This is Adelaide. They're they're one and three. Hey they're guys. They're adorable as can be. Yes, they are. This is my wife. Hi. Hi. Hello. It's nice Hello. to meet you. <laughs> I hope he hasn't been saying too many crazy things. Oh, he's no. been great. Exactly. This has been super helpful. <laughs> yeah, being silly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one quick resource that um I had Nick Adams throw into the uh into the chat was just um a, a little piece that the CDC put out yesterday. It was called What Healthcare Providers Need to Know, and it's all about the Pfizer vaccine has ingredients, has how it works, has all the recommendations on who should get it, who shouldn't get it. Um, if people that have had COVID, should they get it? Or people, It's all in there. So it was a really great webinar. Um, so you should definitely take a peek at it. I think that's a great uh, resource that's out there. I know Raj has asked, you know, what, what else is out there besides this amazing podcast? Like, so I, I will say one thing on, we had our Texas NAMSP chapter call today. We do this uh, once a week, once every other week. And one of the big questions, because now we're facing all the, uh, the folks in the emergency department are now the virus is uh, the virus, the vaccine is coming online. Um, I think we're going to start one of my partners is getting vaccinated tomorrow in the next week. It's, it's out there. The big question is what about those uh, female physicians who are either pregnant or immediate postpartum and still lactated. And apparently ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecology, have issued a statement that said, all full steam ahead, get the vaccine. If you're pregnant, far better to get vaccinated than to get COVID. And if you're lactating, go ahead and get the vaccine. Have y'all have y'all seen the ACOG statement? They mentioned that statement. They mentioned that on the CDC thing yesterday. That the the ACOG they communicated with ACOG. It was great timing. Uh, my sister Lynn uh, was just texting me about that. Uh, she's a brand new mom and was asking about that exact thing. So that's good news. Yeah. All right. Well, that's you know the other thing that's interesting too is you're talking about the spike protein, Jeff, and I think part of the phase one trial, uh, if I read some of the early, some of the phase one stuff is there were four, at least on the Pfizer, there were four different vaccines that they trialed in phase one. I thought it was each. Was it two? Maybe it was Moderna that was four. One of them was four, I thought. And that that's what they were trying was sort of different RM, mRNA strands is what I, my understanding is that they were trying to figure out that the, that sweet spot of like which protein which protein you'd want to make to create the immune response. So, do we? Um, so we're like an hour fifteen. Yeah, I want to make we, sure that, yeah that we you know if you've got question guys, I know sorry about the echo of the last you know ten minutes or so, but if you've got questions, really throw them in the chat while you know we're all sitting here hanging out. <laughs> 
Yeah. Right. So I'd love I think that one of the questions, one of the questions was about what if you've already had COVID-19, should you get vaccinated? I, I can tell you what the CDC answer was yesterday on the call. Um, it, the CDC answer was that because we don't have enough knowledge about lifelong immunity or how long the immunity lasts once you've had it, that they would recommend that you get it. However, the data on reinfection, and there does appear to be, there definitely are cases of reinfection described. The data seems to be that none of them have occurred within 90 days. So their recommendation is that if you are within 90 days of your infection, that you can wait to be later in the, in the, in the group. Right. Um, to, to, so you get closer to 90 days to get vaccinated. On the other hand, they also said that if you want to get it earlier, the only thing that they recommend is don't get vaccinated during the phase where you might still be infectious. Right. Um, and so really, yes, at this point, because we, the knowledge on any long-term knowledge on SARS-CoV-2 it, it stretches back an entire year. Yeah. Um, and uh, I believe we're on the one year anniversary of Mike thinking he got it from somewhere. <laughs> I got it a year ago. I'm not. Even- <laughs> um, you were sick yeah. for like eight weeks. I will say that. I am still sick. Um, I've got, I'm, and, I'm long haulers. Um, you know, so we don't know how long you're, you've got immunity for. Uh, if you've been sick and it does uh, again, because of the mechanism that seems to be fairly well studied, it seems that it would be safe um, to get the vaccine, even if you've already had it. Ross has a great question and I want to throw this off here. Well, Mikey, hold that. Um, okay. I want to follow up on this reinfection thing, um, because I think it's fascinating. And one of the ways I think it is fascinating is how we know that people reinfected. So I had uh, one of my medics was seeing their private physician who was swearing up and down that it's impossible to get reinfected. So I think it might be interesting to talk about why that doctor was off. Um, And it goes back to the mutation. The way we've been able to tell this is we've actually been able to identify the specific strain of the virus because it has mutated, but it is so small, such a small mutation that even though we can get to, uh, tell the difference, it doesn't have a clinical difference. But we had people who were positive. We were able to type out their strain of the virus they're infected. Right. They then tested negative. So you can't pick up viral particles anymore. And then they tested positive again. And we were able to type that uh, infection. And they're different. Now, the mechanism is the same, but they're different enough that you can say, no, these are clearly two different strains. This is a reinfection. So absolutely reinfections are occurring. Perfect. I, I so, got the, the questions. Question. I think the, the questions are starting to fly in now because we're they're feeling the the urge to the end here. But um, so Ross says, am I way off base in thinking maybe I don't need to be in 1A since I have access to PPE, use it as recommended, and maintain a strict social bubble? I feel like others should be ahead of me in line. I've seen quite a few COVID patients in the ambulance, and I'm confident in the effectiveness of the PPE since I haven't gotten it and I'm tested weekly myself. So curious what your thoughts are with that. You know, we had a really vigorous discussion. My understanding is that the NEMSP board had a very vigorous discussion about this topic. And, and you know, your gut response is, well, of course, our first responders should be 1A. You're the back, you know, we're the, you're the backbone of like our response plan. Um. And there was a lot of argument around kind of a couple of points. I I could do what one of our friends does, Mike, and say three things and then list five. (laughs) Um, But we have a friend that repeatedly does that. It's not you, Jeff. Don't worry. Um, uh, I'll just tell you I'm going to do 30 different points. Yeah. No, no. We had three things, five. But anyway, 
One is that um, in the EMS world, at least in the United States, it appears that PPE works. Those agencies that are wearing PPE um, appropriately, when you look, when you do the, in, including in our region, when you when you do the contact tracing, when you figure out where the infections came from, they didn't come from work. And so that was one thing. Well, the PPE works. Number two, our first responder population, our fire and EMS population, for the most part, is younger and healthier. And so they're not in the risk group that is kind of most dangerous. Um, it, you know, and I think that that's a key question or component. Um, and so we had a pretty vigorous debate about, I mean, not we, because I'm not part of the leadership anymore, but that was a real question is whether um, somebody in a nursing home should get this ahead of, of a first responder. Um, I think the counter to that is that, uh, it, that quarantine takes out large chunks of our workforce uh, and that if there's an infection, you might have an infection kind of run through your department and, in, and you may not get have a lot of problems because you're all young and healthy, but you're still going to affect your ability to respond to the community. Yeah. And, and, you, and one of the side questions people ask too is, well, I'm young and healthy. Why don't I just go get the coronavirus and not get this vaccine? But one, people die. I mean, one of my partners just took care of a 40-year-old who died. Maybe they went up to the ICU last week and Hayden took care of him. I don't know. But there was a 40-year-old that... <laughs> yeah, that we, we just that, admitted one last night. Yeah. I mean, there was a 40-year-old that, that we took care of that one of my partners worked her butt off to take care of and the patient ultimately died in the ICU. Uh, and then this whole long hauler piece and this piece, there is significant morbidity with the disease. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think that fundamentally our ability to respond to the community could be negatively impacted if the, if exactly, if our folks get sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the other issue is that one of the, this is another question my dad was asking is why do people worry about this? Uh, if you're young and healthy, don't worry about it. Well, it's a bit like saying, um, you know, if you're playing Russian roulette, five out of six times, you have nothing to worry about. Well, that's true, but that six one's a bitch. Right. You just don't know. You have plenty of, even though the vast majority, this is an odds thing, even though the vast majority of young healthy people do well, are you going to be in the that small percentage and sometimes you just can't tell right well the best way to not die from coronavirus is to not get it absolutely <laughs> and, and and you know there you, one of the arguments that we see when we see deniers and stuff and they're like well you know 99 percent of the people survive or you know that sort of thing and and but the reality is i i've I've not seen anything like this. And we're in a relatively, you know, Oregon's done really pretty well compared to the rest of the country. But when I see young, healthy people die from this, which we've all seen much more so than I see with the flu, I, I, you can throw all that. And I'm a data guy, but, but one of the things that when you, there's data and there's stories and they're both important. And I can tell you that the stories that I see are mu very different than anything I've ever seen in my 20 something years of being an emergency physician. Um, and, and, and people who are, who get the flu and get sick for three days, you know, I hear, Oh, well you can get myocarditis with the flu. You absolutely can. I've seen one or two cases in my life. This seems to be an order of magnitude different than that. Um, and so I think it's still um, incumbent on us to prevent people from getting sick. And, and then if you're young and healthy and you get sick, you can pass it on to other people. Exactly. So you're going to make the pandemic worse.
Yeah, and I think this is one of these cases. The thing that is so unique about this virus, at least to the things, I'm sure there are other viruses like this, but none that we've really had to deal with, is this whole concept of asymptomatic spread. Yeah. You have people who don't know, they're not feeling any symptoms, and therefore their entire life's experience tell them they're not sick. And they don't need to quarantine. They don't need to wear a mask. They don't need to not go around other people. And yet they can just be spewing viral particles out into the atmosphere and not know it. And that is really something that is unique to this vaccine, at least in terms of the things that we've been aware of. So I think that's a big difference. Um, and we just really have to, to acknowledge that. The other thing I think we have to deal with as we're looking at what impact we're going to see from the vaccine is change our depth perception, if you will. So we're very focused on being hyper acutely focused on the individual because that's really the type of medicine we practice. And we need to pan back and think about the impact on society. And this is more of a public health issue. If we want to be able to go on our Kentucky bourbon tour and go see the damn Corvette Museum for our flight bridge special, we have to have an impact not on us as individuals, but on us as a society. This is a public health issue, and the real benefit of the vaccine is it it has the potential to knock down that R0 and really interfere with the transmission of the disease. That's where we need to stop it. Absolutely. Absolutely. it sounds like I think Hayden's got a roll. Um, this yeah. has been about 90 minutes now. Good work. To yeah, come back and do an in-depth review of the of the um, Pfizer paper, and maybe the Moderna paper will come out in the meantime too. Um, I think um, I think the one thing I want to say is I just want to be super clear. Um, if that if I get texted in the next five minutes that I can get this vaccine this week, I'm in. All right. I am getting my first shot of this vaccine in the next week or two. I can freaking guarantee it. Hopefully they'll take my picture while I get it so I can share it with you all on the Twitter. Um, so speaking of that, let me interrupt. But I'm in, and I think it's important to hear that from all, all, all of us on this. Yeah. Um, so we're two, the reason I want to interrupt you about that is I want to ask a favor. And I want to ask this favor of everybody listening but it definitely seems like just from logistics, hospital staff are probably going to get the virus vaccine first. So what I would like to ask is when you get the shot, and I'm going to get it as soon as I possibly can. My guess is sometime this week. I'm going to videotape it. I want you to videotape it. And I want us to put this together. We will send out something from, hey, Flybridge Ed, this is how committed we are to the vaccine. We are first in line. Um, I want all of our medical directors doing the same thing. Uh, as soon as our medics are able to get it and you get it, please do the same thing. Video, Absolutely. take a picture of it, push it out on social media saying, listen, I think this is the right thing to do. And this is how I can show you I did it myself. Yeah. yeah. I will just add that our friends at EMS World have started that. And they just, uh, you know, if you get out there, use the hashtag EMS Vax, V-A-X. And let's just let's just share it. Let's get people out there. I want people to feel safe and empowered to get this because it's gonna it's gonna make a huge difference. So, uh, for me, just to follow up what Dr. Sonny said, I'm in. I'm not front line out there. I work with all these uh, men and women who are out there doing that. Um, but as soon as I can get it, I'm in. I'm gonna do it. Yep. Yeah, so, I guess I gotta ask you this. So, first off, props to Hillary uh, and her folks at uh, EMS World. I love the concept of the hashtag. How do you spell it? E M S V A X. X. Okay. That's what I was wondering. The Vax is. Uh, oh, I think I did it wrong. Uh, <laughs> no, I did it right. I did it right. All right. Hayden, are you in? I'm in, yes. You know, I, I think I had some initial apprehensions, but after what I've studied, learned, and, and really discovered about these vaccines, I think they're perfectly safe and um, important for the everyone to get. So I'll be first in line. 
Awesome. Well, Dr. Hayden Smith, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I want to get us out of here. It has been a great night. Such amazing engagement. People watching. It's been our biggest one ever. It's just so awesome. So thank you so much. And stay tuned for the uh, you know the audio version of this. We'll get this released just as soon as we can, as soon as I get a chance to edit it. So on behalf of Dr. Hayden Smith, Dr. Ratu Sani, Dr. Jeff Jarvis, Mike Verkest, you've been watching the live edition of the Second Shift Podcast, um, a proud member of the Flight Jed Podcast Network and a fire dog production you got that right we will see you guys later be safe get the vaccine and we will talk to you guys soon take care yeah bye y'all take care guys